step one. All right, well, uh, if you are here for defense, you have come to the right place. Um, I, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't taught this class for more than two years, um, which uh, bothers me because uh, I have felt for a long time that defense is um, one of the most undertaught topics in bridge. Um, it's the hardest part of the game. Uh, I don't think there is really any question to that. Um, it takes, I think, uh, the longest to master. Um, you know, a lot of your basic bidding is memorization. You get that down, you can get up to speed pretty quickly. Declare play, yeah, you know, there's, uh, there's some technical things that you learn along the way, some of the finer points, but a lot of the fundamentals, you know, um, um, we can get you up to speed on that stuff pretty quickly. Defense is not easy at all. Um, it's a grind. And when you are defending, uh, you are at a disadvantage because the declare can see the collective assets that his side holds, and you cannot. I mean, we all get to see two hands, we all get to see our hand and the dummy, um, but you don't get to see what's in your partner's hand when you're defending, uh, and that makes it a lot trickier. Um, so, you know, that, that gives the declaring side an advantage. And it's kind of funny sometimes when you, you know, when you talk to people who haven't played bridge, they think it's really strange sometimes that one of the hands becomes the dummy. They think, well, if a hand is exposed, um, you know, doesn't that make it too easy? So I think all of us can vouch that there's nothing about this game that is too easy. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and still, you know, even getting to, to see the dummy, um, it, you know, you, you have to figure out with those two closed hands that you can't see, um, and you're trying to defend and figure out which of those missing cards could be in your partner's hand and which could be in declare's hand. Uh, and that makes it really difficult. Another thing that makes defense exceptionally difficult <laughs> is that you have to choose your opening lead before you have seen the dummy. Um, so that also puts the defense at a disadvantage. Um, you know, how often have you seen the dummy and you're like, oh, oops, this wasn't a very good lead. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes you are blessed with a very easy natural lead like ace from ace king or you know top of a sequence king from king queen jack or queen from queen jack 10 something like that um, but defending on a lot of other hands where you don't have a lead that is uh, close to automatic is uh, is not easy at all um, and defense is not as forgiving as declare play I see declares make technical errors all the time and still take exactly the same number of tricks that they were supposed to take because the defense, they, 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 they got away with a, a technical mistake. The defense gave the trick back to them or uh, the lie of the cards did not hurt them. Um, defense is not as forgiving. You get away with more mistakes when you play the hand than when you defend the hand. Um, and even sometimes when you don't get off to the best opening lead, you can still recover the defense, not always. Um, and then really just the last piece and just kind of the, the general comments about defense is um, a lot of people don't want to work on their game, on their defensive game. It's not sexy. It is a grind. Bidding is sexy. Playing the hand is sexy. Defense is hard. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, it, it really takes um, a concerted effort. I will tell you that, I, I mean, I, at one point, I made very early on when I was playing this game, I made a, I made a deliberate, you know, I, mean, like, yeah, I mean, I don't remember the date or anything, I didn't circle it on the calendar, but I said, I am going to work on my defense. I'm going to be a better defender. I had played the game long enough to figure out, I'm like, if I'm going to start distinguishing myself, I need to defend better. And I really started working at it. Um, not just you know reading and you know talking to mentors and things like that, but um, but you know just even at the table, um, and yeah we're in a timed event, so it, it's very hard sometimes to think things through. Um, any of you who, who have played with or against me, if you ever see me pause, I'm a pretty fast player. But if you see me slow down for a minute to think, it is almost always when I'm defending, not when I'm playing, um, because that it's it's you know. 
the, the rusty wheels in there are, you know, you got to get them turning, to get, the, get, them, get them lubed up and get them going and figure out what's going on. So if you work at your defense and you really dedicate yourself, I, I truly started to see better results. I started to get better scores on a more regular basis, um, as unpredictable as match points can be at times. And the way that I think you want to think about defense, um, it is a process of elimination. What you're trying to do is eliminate leads that are clearly wrong. And ultimately, it comes down to, um, it comes down to a, a choice among four, right? Kind of like a multiple choice, or as I like to say, multiple guess exam, right? Um, you're, and they always tell you when you're taking a standardized test, okay, if we give you this multiple choice question and you have A, B, C, and D, you know, eliminate one or two of the answers that are clearly wrong so that you have a better chance to get it right, right? So you're, you're, you're reducing the, the random element, you know, and trying to pick, you think, well, I think A or B could be right. Well, at least you've reduced your choices to two and you have a better shot uh, than out of four. Of course, what I always told people when they told me that about standardized tests, I'm like, what if I can't eliminate any of the answers? What if, all four, what if none of the four look like they're clearly wrong? But I think you will find sometimes when you're defending um, that you can eliminate some things that are, that are clearly wrong, and that will steer you toward hopefully the right lead. Because that's ultimately what it comes down to. Once you settle on which suit you need to lead, which card you play in that suit is an easier proposition. So, you know, if you're leading from blank, you know, it's usually a fourth best. Uh, if you're leading from a shorter suit, you're usually leading a, you know, bigger card. Those things are a little more automatic. So ultimately, it, it comes down to um, which of the four suits should you be leading now when you have to make a defensive mistake. I've been talking about this book for years. I've been a big fan of it. Um, I checked this morning. On, um, it looks like you can get it on Amazon if you're interested. I did not see it on Baron Barclay. Um, and so I don't know, um, you know, it may, you, you, you may end up having, I, I don't know it. On Amazon it said something like it was this, uh, that this comes from a third party vendor or you might have to get a used copy or something like that. I thought it was still in print, um, but it's called How the Experts Win a Bridge if you're not familiar with this one. And the authors are Burt Hall and Lynn Rose Hall. Um, this book is about all things bridge, and I think it's a really good book in general. Um, but chapter four in this book is dedicated to defense. It is the best summary of defense uh, that I've seen anywhere in any materials. What's the author again? It's Burt Hall and Lynn Rose Hall hyphenated. Um, I think they're, they're uh, a couple from back east. So this book was written about, I think 1996 was the publication. So it's been around for a while. Um, and in the past, it's always been available. Um, so some, sometimes with bridge books, you know, if it's not among the, the most popular titles, sometimes uh, it can be a little tricky to, to find them. I, I still think it's fantastic. Um, and what they do uh, in their book is they break defense down to uh, what they call the five lines of defense. Because sometimes defense seems so random. You're like, well, I don't know what I should lead. Should I lead this unbid suit? Should I lead Trump? Do I lead Fort Best? Um, and what they really do is give you sort of a, um, a, a template for choosing which line of defense is best, um, and this is based on um, not just the look of your hand, but all of the information that you can draw from the bidding. So um, our plan for today is we wanna talk about the tools that you have as a defender. Um, we wanna talk about opening leads, good ones, bad ones, you know, why they're good, why they're bad. Um, and then we'll wind down with, um, we'll go through uh, what is covered on, on uh, one of the handouts, which I call my dirty dozen of defense. It's kind of 12 bullet points um, that I think are good uh, all-purpose um, advice on defense. So when we talk about the tools that you have as a defender, 
Um, yes, this begins with your hand, but uh, we, we want you to, as uh, we we want you to, to you got to look beyond your nose. There is so much more to defense than the 13 cards that are right in front of your face. Um, and in fact, um, I usually talk about five things, and these are, these are, these are actually out, out of the book. Um, but we want to give you five tools. Again, these are five tools, not including the cards in your own hand, what you see there, which obviously can give you a lot of indicators on defense, but not everything that you need. So, many of you, I think, have, um, have heard me talk about um, inferences, <laughs> negative inferences in particular. Those of you who did uh, language of bridge, this was the, uh, you know, this is our, uh, our interpret, you know, what, what Woolsey called the, the, the dogs that don't bark. It's very easy to see and remember what everybody's bidding at the table. But this game really requires you to think kind of, you know, inside out, if you will, and think about what didn't get bid. What could this person have done that they had an opportunity to do but didn't do? Because you can glean a lot of information from those negative inferences. Um, same thing on the play of the hand. Now, this uh, obviously we don't get to that until after the opening lead has been made, but as you're trying to work things out on defense, once the play of the hand has started, sometimes you ask yourself, why isn't Declare attacking that suit? Hmm, maybe they have a problem in that suit. Maybe partner has the cards that I can't see in that suit. And I didn't want to attack this suit because I was afraid of giving away a trick. But if partner had this honor in that suit, well, leaving that suit suddenly looks more attractive. That sort of thing. So you can get a lot of clues um, from what is not happening during the auction and during the play. So we have counting points. high card points to try and place missing high cards. In a few minutes here, we're actually going to go through an exercise where we do just that with, we'll give you, a, we'll give you an auction and uh, uh, in your hand, and then we'll show you the dummy and just start to get you to take you through that process. Your opponents open a no trump, something like that, and then let's say, let's say responder goes through an invitational sequence, and they end up in three no, something like that. So you figure the opponents have right around 25 or 26 points, right? What you would expect them to have to be in three no. And you're looking at five points in your own hand. Well, you can now place your partner with probably about nine, right? That's the kind of thing that we're doing. Now, where those points are, that's the hard part to figure out, right? But at least as cards start to become exposed during the play, you realize what there's room for partner to have and what there's room for partner that partner can't possibly have. So we actually, we actually had a very interesting hand came up last week, Jan, I think we'll remember this one from Friday, uh, where our opponents ended up in six no trump. And Jan found herself on opening lead. Now we figure if they're going to play six no trump, and there was a no trump opening before they ended up at six no, so one hand was known to have 15 to 17 balance. So they should have about 33-ish, maybe 34 points to be in this slam. Turned out I think they only had 31, so they had overbid a little bit. All right. Well, Jan was on lead looking at a king and a king and a, and a queen, and maybe a jack. <laughs> well, this, what is there room for me to have? I was her partner. Absolutely nothing, right? So what we talked about on this hand was 
um, you try and find the passive lead. You don't want to lead away from a king because I can't possibly have a queen or an ace in that suit, right? So you look for the suit where you have nothing and you make a passive lead because it's the least likely to give something away. So that's, that's the kind of uh, inference that you can draw and you're counting, you're counting points there, right? Assuming that the opponents haven't, have, that the train hasn't come completely off the track and that they do it, yeah, again, they were a couple points shy of really wanting to be in six snow, um, but the contract was close to having play. I mean, it was not, but I've certainly been in worse slams, so. Um, now this is harder, I think, than counting the missing high card points. Trying to track the distribution of all the hands at the table, that's pretty tricky. But as best you can, you want to try and get a feel for the distribution, especially declare. The bidding will help you here, right? You know, if they open a major, you know, you can expect five cards in that suit, and then if they, you know, and then based on whether or not they support a suit that their partner bid, or if they show a second suit, you, know, you start piecing together the distribution of the closed hand. Don't always get it exactly. But that is a tool that is available to you and will help you with that process of elimination. This I, I hope you're always doing anyhow. <laughs> how, many, how many tricks do you need <laughs> to set a contract or a lot of times in the case of match points you're just trying to limit over tricks, right? Because that can make a big difference on your result. So um, this, this tends to come in, into play. Um, um, you know, you know it's, this is more that process of, okay, well, if partner has this card, then maybe we could beat four spades, but if partner doesn't have that card and it's in Declare's hand, then they always have 10 tricks and we can never beat four spades. So sometimes it kind of helps you with your, with your mission on the hand, you know, trying to figure out can you have tricks anywhere other than, than what you see. And then this is what we'll be getting to last week. You don't have to do this all on your own. Hopefully partner's giving you a little bit of help um, through our defensive signals. So carding, you know, how partner follows uh, to, uh, you know, to a, a, a trick, like if you're on opening lead, a lot of times you'll get, um, we'll get into talking about different types of signals, but an attitude signal at trick one, partner likes your lead, partner doesn't like your lead. Um, we have count. Again, that's a little trickier. The count stuff is always trickier, um, but uh, there are situations where it's really critical to give partner accurate count to help with this, help your partner count the distribution, if not for a whole hand, at least for an individual suit. Um, suit preference we're gonna talk about, another type of signal. Um, and we'll get into you know when we you know when we're giving an attitude signal and when we're giving a count signal and when we're giving a, a suit preference signal. We'll get all to that uh, toward the end. Um, and then and then discards right. The first time that you fail to follow suit, whether they're playing a no trump or a suit contract, the first time that you can't follow suit, this is usually a very important signal, right? This is an opportunity. Yeah, one, one, one of my players in Castle Rock several years ago, when she got, got started with, with Bridge, said, asked me when we were, we were talking about defense, and said, you're, li you're allowed to signal? Isn't that unfair? Isn't that cheating? <laughs> All right, well, you know, we use our signals and, you know, 
see bridge not easy, right? <laughs> what we talked about before, even with signals. <laughs> of course, if this was all that easy, we, we wouldn't keep playing it, right? 